any data that we can put in, a for, in the form of a matrix, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, whether it's a bunch of text documents, uh, whether it's a collection of images, um, of songs, um, of whatever. If you can write it in terms of a matrix, you can apply PCA to it, um, and then you can use that as a tool for visualization. Um, everything we've done up to, and then we sort of PCA, sort of very briefly, um, and without proof, that what it's actually doing is it's trying to find um, a low rank approximation, that is, by that I mean an approximation with as few eigenvalues as possible and only the largest eigenvalues of the actual true data matrix. Okay, so you're trying to find a compressed representation of the data that is actually as close as possible when you measure it in, this, in a uh, quadratic distance, in the L2 distance. Um, and so you could think of PCA as an unsupervised technique and the way the technique, the way you train, um, the way you learn from data when you don't have labels is you look at the data and you try to reproduce the data. You try to come up with a model that is small so that it can, so you can store it in your head. But at the same time, it has to be able to reproduce the data. So the brain is much smaller than the world, but if I close my eyes, I can imagine this classroom. I don't imagine it perfectly, but I imagine it well enough that I can survive and I can do my job and so on. Um, and um, that's essentially the setting of unsupervised um, uh, learning. Um, supervised learning, as the name says, requires some supervision. So here the idea is that um, you have some data, but you also have labels for the data. Okay, so you might have um, some data like I, I could like look at his height and weight and his height and weight and his height and weight and that's the data, essentially the height and weight of everyone in this class. But in addition, I'm going to put a label. I'm going to say male, 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 uh, with the females, female, um, and as we go, yeah, the, the ratio isn't super hot in machine learning. Uh, it's a lot better here than it is. Uh, it's one of the big problems with our field, actually. Um, but once I have labels, then when I get a new person, I measure his height, I measure his weight, and then using the data that I've gathered from before, I can now predict his sex, male or female. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so um, the lecture will I uh, will describe uh, the setting and in, in give two examples. Um, I'm going to introduce supervised learning using linear models and uh, simply because these are very easy to explain and because they connect to a technique called least squares. Um, to get a better, a better idea of where we are, how many of you have seen least squares before? Yeah, about half of the class, okay. Um, so we're going to go over that again, uh, least squares. And then we're actually going to show in the next class the least squares is a maximum likelihood estimate. And then we will move on to actually come up with better estimates and least squares so that you'll never again in your life do least squares. Um, and the reason why I start here is because this one, half of you have seen, and this is the easiest supervised learning, uh, su supervised uh, um, learning um, sort of formulation. Okay. Um, there's reasons to care about uh, linear models. So linear models are very simple. <coughs> the, the essence of a linear model is that the world might look like this, and you're approximating the world by a line. Okay, that's essentially what, where the linear comes in. Um, but many problems out there can be relatively well approximated with lines. Um, the other reason is that often, if something is not approximated by a line, it might be approximated well by two lines. So if you look at modular 
uh, implementations that use many linear models and linear models that work well in different regimes, you're able to actually build some sophisticated systems. In fact, aircraft systems in which we put our life for survival when we fly um, often use these tricks. Um, sort of like linear piecewise control and so on. Um, these are easy because we can do all the math by hand. We don't need any computers to do the math. So um, they're, they're good for teaching purposes. Um, but through linear models, I will able to describe all the important things. Model complexity, maximum likelihood, Bayesian learning, um, cross-validation, um, you know, evidence maximization, and so on. So linear models already present all the problems that, not, that I will have to address when I introduce nonlinear models. Of course, we're going to move on to nonlinear models because they're more fun, and we're going to do neural networks and random forests and all the cool stuff that allows us to do the, the real applications out there. But the principles of how you train them um, are still the same as the principles on how we train linear models. So if you figure out everything with the simpler models, um, when we do the nonlinear models, it will be fairly easy to understand how to do uh, the more complex ones. Okay, this is the setup. Um, we will be given some data. The data will consist of uh, pairs, the data and the labels. And so think of for each x, I'm given a y, and during training, I will observe n x's and n y's. So I get the pairs. Each x is going to be a vector of several attributes. For example, when I was talking about height and weight, uh, I was talking about two attributes, height and weight. So d would be equal to 2. So they're two real numbers. And um, the inputs are also known by many names, predictors. They're called features sometimes. They're called covariates. Um, depending on which field or where you learn the stuff, you'll, you often refer to these. Interesting. <laughs> With different names. <laughs> as long as it's not the project. OK. Um, and the output are often the the outputs are known as the targets, the labels, or the variants. I, mostly I will use features, input outputs, or I, I'll talk about features and labels. Um, and in the, here I'm going to assume that the labels are just real numbers. Okay. Um, later we will deal with the case where they're binary things, like for example sex, male, female. Um, but if we learn how to do this case first, that next case will be easy. Okay, here's an example that's sort of very trendy right now, uh, which is you want to predict energy consumption. Because if you can predict how much energy you, if you, if you, need, if you can predict um, the temperature at which you need to set a thermostat so that everyone is at a comfortable temperature in this room, um, then um, one can actually save a lot of, uh, save a lot of money because quite often the thermostat is set up too high, there's a lot of people in the room, it gets really hot, we're wasting actual uh, energy and when we all leave that thermostat still stays on even though there's no one here. Um, if the wind is blowing outside then that thermostat should be adjusted a bit higher because it's colder as a result. Um, so if we could automate um, that thermostat we would make much better use of energy. And if we can reduce the energy spend, the spending of Canada by 10%, um, we've done a huge contribution towards saving the, the polar bears and whatnot. <laughs> OK. So this is the setup. Just like the height and um, weight, um, one, the first data point, x1, in my example might be the wind speed which is 100 and the number of people inside the building right now assume that there were two people and and essentially what I do is on the first day so day one 
On the first day, I collect the wind speed outside, or I just use my iPhone app that gives me the wind speed for Vancouver. Um, I check how many people are inside the room, and then I adjust the thermostat to some setting. And that thermostat setting is what I'm going to call Y1, which is 5. And this is the setting at which everyone is, those two people will be happy, the temperature is comfortable. Okay, it's nice, I don't know, 20 degrees or whatever. On the second day, I do the same thing. I measure the wind outside, it's 50 knots. I count that there are 42 people inside the building. And then I adjust the thermostat to be by hand until it is 25. And because it's comfortable, um, at that temperature. Don't you need to set the temperature to one thing because that's what you're comfortable on? Well, uh, <laughs> it might be that um, <coughs> the setting of the thermostat will depend on how many people there are in the room. So this number here is the thermostat setting. If there are many people in the room producing heat, I probably can use a lower number. Okay. The thermostat. Okay. So that's the setup. I repeat this as I show here, n equal four times. Okay. And in this case, there are again d equal two attributes. Now, on the fifth day, I could come back here, use my iPhone app, measure the wind speed. Um, come back here, count the number of people, and adjust the set. But it turns out that the fifth day is Friday, and I want to get out of here early, and I want to go out and to the pub and have a beer or whatever. And so I don't want to work. Um, this is what I can do. I connect my iPhone to that thermostat directly. It gets the wind speed from the web. I put a camera with a wire connected to that thermostat. And that camera, every time someone, because it has a face detector, which is a standard app with your iPhone, um, every time someone walks in, it counts that person as being in the room. So now all of a sudden, my system, my little iPhone, knows how many people there are in this room, and it knows the wind speed. If it, in addition, had a model that tells me how can I adjust the energy requirement, y, as a function of x, if it had a model which is what should y be as a function of x, it could automatically set y. Okay, so it would measure what um, the first x is, what the second x is, and then it would predict what y is. Okay, that's what we're after. We're after that automation. That you provide labels for four days, and on the fifth day, you want a model to predict what y should be for the new x. You get to observe the x, and you predict what y is. Okay. And that's pretty much what I'm saying here. So after you've collected any, n observations for training, we are going to get a new value on the n plus one day and we're going to make a prediction on that n plus one day. So we talk about two phases in this process. The first phase is what I call training. And in training, you are given uh, pairs of data, x1 to n, y1 to n. That goes into your learning machine and what your learning machine will give you is a model and that model is described by a set of parameters O oh. So we get some parameters for the model. Now, once we've estimated these parameters, and I will describe what kind of models we have and what parameters we have, 
and in particular the models that we'll start using are linear models and once I have those parameters I'm going to enter the second stage which is the validation stage which is validation or prediction <coughs> okay. in this second stage I'm given a new x or 2 and I also have my theta that I learned I will plug these into my predict machine and I will produce predictions of what y should be okay. so that's the first we learn given in pairs once we have theta which is our captures our model we use that theta with new inputs new axes to predict new y's and that, that's essentially the setup for uh, learning that's the same setup when we do neural nets or where we do random forests or boosting or any other technique all the supervised learning basically uses the setup um, in linear um, mind almost all of it there, there are some techniques that actually avoid the use of parameters altogether but um, we're not going to encounter those in this course the, for the, the way you do this with a linear model is as follows <coughs> now actually before uh, I do the linear model I'm going to do one more example um, um, so, an, another, so energy prediction is an example to which you could apply these models um, another one is medical um, informatics where often you have uh, many measurements from a patient um, like for example in, in prostate cancer um, there's a famous data set which comes from this book which is available on the course website for free and it describes this data set which is um, you know a bunch of medical variables that describe a patient the age some measurements about the, the prostate um, cancer volume and so on um, and then you're trying to uh, predict some uh, some antigen to see how well the patient will deal with the treatment um, again we have many variables many attributes and you're trying to predict um, something um, uh, a, a variable for, uh, for treatment and quite often it might be the case that you don't want to actually um, every time go and uh, for, for some patients you might actually want to just make some measurements and predict how well they will react to treatment um, so there's also this question that when you have many inputs how to select inputs and that's another question that we will address with linear models and we'll continue addressing it with uh, nonlinear models it's not just about predicting how well the patient will recover it's also about identifying which are the variables that are useful for predicting how well the patient will recover because if it's not necessary to measure the prostate weight in order to make a good prediction then um, a lot of men would find that uh, quite comforting because they don't have to go <coughs> through very invasive tests okay this is a linear model okay? it's the equation of a line and hence it's a linear model so this is just your mx plus b uh, theta 1 is the intercept theta 2 is the slope okay so <coughs> okay so we basically going back to very basic stuff from um, our days uh, in early <coughs> early high school where if you want to fit a line A line has a slope the slope is theta 2 
it has an intercept, which is theta 1. And the equation of the line, this line here is y, which is a function of x. A line is a function of x. And that's equal to theta 1 plus x theta 2. Now, typically, in learning, what happens is we are given many data points and we're trying to get a line that goes through these data points. Okay, a line that describes the data points. Each of these data points <coughs> is a particular instance of an input and an output. Okay? And there will be many of these input outputs and then what I'm trying to do is just to get a line that goes through these points. Let's throw a few more there. In order to fit this line, in order to, to get a line that goes um, through the points, what I'm going to require is that the quadratic distances between the points and the evaluation of the line at the point, which is y hat evaluated at xi, I want that gap to be small. So I want this height, which is yi minus y of xi, and I'm going to square it because some of them will be positive, some are, uh, above the line, some are, will be below the line, so I want them to be all positive, so I just square them. And so I want this distance yi minus, for short, I'm just going to write y hat i instead of y of xi. And I want this to be small for, for the ith point. So I want it, so you can think of this as a spring here. And I want that spring to be as compressed as possible. And each of these points will have one such spring. And so we're trying to find, so you could imagine that if you had a line with a bunch of springs and those points were nails, and if you'd let that line go, it would sort of go did, 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 and stabilize. And it will stabilize at the point of least energy usage for the springs. Okay, so these and so on. So we want to minimize the amount of purple in this image, basically, the, the amount of spring. Okay, so that's the setup. So I want to minimize um, all the sums of all the distances. So I look at all the distances from the points to the line, the vertical distance, and I want to minimize uh, the sum of those vertical systems, the sum of the squared distances. This is called least squares because you're trying to find the least of the square, you're minimizing the squares, the square distances. <coughs> now, because, because yi is theta 1 plus xi, so theta 1 plus xi theta 2, if I plug this I, into the equation, if I use the expression for y hat, then that gives me now a function yi minus theta 1 minus xi theta 2, and my goal is to be able to solve for theta 1 and theta 2. So the goal is to solve for theta 1 and theta 2. That's what learning is in the context of a linear model. It's just finding the intercept and the slope of the line so that this line goes through the points. Okay, so it's a very simple concept. Um, and then 
where we're going to move on to do things a bit more interesting is that quite often here we're assuming that x only has one attribute but of course often as we've seen like in the case or example in the, in the cancer example there x often has many attributes so we're going to have to go to high dimensions in, in 1D we use a line in 2D we use a plane in 3D and 4D and ND we will use something called a hyperplane which we can't visualize but we can just label it uh, we can write the equation for it and it's essentially a, a line in high dimensions okay so this is the setup this is how we're going to do learning um, once we do um, so so this essentially will be learning and once we have learned we can make predictions right because y hat is just equal to theta 1 let's assume we've learned uh, two parameters theta 1 and theta 2 I'm putting a hat to indicate that we've learned and then when I get a new point xn plus 1 the prediction is just the evaluation of the line at that point okay. so in the picture this would be this here is uh, xn plus 1 it's a point for which I don't know what y is I don't know its label but even though I don't know its label I can just evaluate its height and this height is yn plus 1 okay, it's the, the line evaluated at that point and that's my prediction So we've done both, the, the learning and the prediction. And the rest of the class is just how to do this with matrices so that we can do high dimensions. And how do we solve for theta 1, theta 2? How do we come up with a way of solving this efficiently? OK. Um, this is called an objective function. Go ahead. So this brings are all horizontal. Uh, there would also be a way to minimize the or vertical. There'd be also a way to minimize the like horizontal spring distance or just the distance of them, like the shortest distance to the. Yes. Line. So um, that would work better. Not, not the horizontal, but perpendicular would work better. <laughs> uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna come back to that late. Okay. Not in this class, but in two classes. Is it, yeah, I guess it, it For now, we're going to use the standard thing that half of you have learned before, which is the vertical distances. But obviously, that's not the best you can do. Okay. All right. Now, we're gonna tr I'm going to try to generalize this. So here, I was using d equal 1 <coughs> for this example, so only one attribute. But now I want to talk about cap, you know, D attributes, many more attributes and, um, and, and, and points. So typically the way we're going to do this is we're going to write this with the following expression, which is we're going to take for each point i, and i here is the index of uh, the data points. So like i equal 1, i equal 2, i equal 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, so the different cases. And d is an index of the features, height and weight. And so if I have more features, I would have to, for each feature, have one particular parameter. So have x i 1 times theta 1 plus x i 2 times theta 2 plus etc. xid times theta d. So now I have the equation of a plane in d dimensions. Okay, but it's still a line really, it's still an x times theta. We've just gone to a higher dimension where we can't visualize but it's still the same equation. Um, each of the x's that I measured for uh, times uh, uh, d. 
So in the case where I had height, so xi1 would be the height and xi2 would be the weight. And then my model would be y equal 1. And now I'm going to use a trick. I'm going to make one of the x's be 1 times theta 1 plus xi1 times theta 2 plus xi2 times theta 3. And if I wanted to be on the same scale, I probably would want to label this 2, label this 3, so that it's a bit more consistent with what I had before. Okay. The reason why I introduced this 1 okay, is because if I make that 1 be an x all the time, then instead of having to write Instead of having to write an equation in the form y equal theta naught plus theta 1 x, I can just write it as y equal sum from i equal 1 to 2 of theta i, theta j, sorry, x j. Okay, provided that x1 is equal to 1. So instead of writing y is equal to theta naught plus theta 1x, I just want to write it as with uh, when I introduce vectors. Let me introduce vectors first. I want to write it as a single x times theta. I don't want to have plus theta naught all the time. And so the way to do that is I just make that first vector of x's all be equal to 1. And if that first column is all ones, and so I'm just basically, I've created an extra input that is always set to one. And that allows me to write it um, as just y equal x times theta. Okay, so that's how, that's the reason for basically setting xi1 equal to one, so that I can now equivalently write. Um, the linear equation for d dimensions either using this equation or this equation. They are the same equation. One is matrix, matrix vector notation. Uh, one is just a component wise equation. And then if we want to expand it, that equation by writing all the terms, that is the equation of a plane in height and d dimensions. Okay? And so I'm always al allowing for the first column to be once so that, because um, I need a constant term. Can I borrow a sheet of paper? Because yeah. say that we're in 2D with the height and the weight. So one theta controls my slope in this direction. The other theta controls the slope in this direction. But I need the, f the bias term, the free term, theta naught to change the height. So I can change the height and tilt it. So I need three parameters to control this, to control this, and to control this. Once I have those three parameters, I have full control of the plane. In higher dimensions, we can't visualize it, but it's the same idea. Uh, okay, That's the linear model, y equal x times theta. And typically, what we do is we plug all the n observations and in the vector y, which is uh, uh, n by 1. The matrix is n by d with the, first, oh, the matrix x, n by d with 1s in the first column. And then there are d parameters, which are unknown. And the goal of learning is to solve for these d parameters, the d thetas. Okay, so that's the linear model. That's the 
And the matrix notation, simply we introduce it because um, it's a lot easier to write this than to write this. When we do the, uh, we will have to introduce some extra tools of math to deal with matrices and matrix derivatives. Um, but if we learn to use matrices, it's a lot easier to code with matrices and it's a lot easier to, um, you know, come up with estimates and so on. They're a good abstraction. Okay, so here's an example. Let's go back to our wind speed where we had uh, our example of energy prediction where we had, uh, whoops, we had uh, the number of people in the building, the wind speed, and then the energy requirement. And so here, Y would just be the vector of labels, uh, of the setting of the thermostat. Um, to the matrix X, I've added a column of ones and then I put in the two attributes. And so now I need to estimate three parameters, theta one, theta two, and theta three. Um, sometimes I call the first theta theta naught, sometimes I call it theta one, it's just a name, so it doesn't matter. Um, now, let's assume that we have already learned the good theta. So let's assume that we knew that the theta was, the learned theta was equal to one, zero, zero point five. If I knew that, of course we don't know because we still haven't learned theta. But let's assume well, we have learned it already. Then if I wanted to make predictions, I just need, I make predictions by multiplying x times theta hat. So in particular, I just, this is my x, this is my theta hat, and that gives me y hat. And those are my predictions. And here I'm doing four predictions at the same time. Now, I'm predicting on the training set. And the reason why I'm predicting on the training set, it kind of doesn't make sense. Why would I want to predict on the training set? In the training set, I already know what Y is. But the reason why I predict it is because then I can compare it to the true Y and I know whether I'm doing well or not. Okay, so. Of course, I also want to predict on the test set. So the, on the fifth day, on the Friday, my iPhone counts 20 people in the building and, tw and 50 knots outside, and then my iPhone multiplies uh, the vector xn plus 1 <coughs> times theta hat, and my iPhone computes the setting of the thermostat, sets the thermostat to 11, and it's done. Okay. It might sound gimmicky, but recently I saw a company in the Bay Area that was doing exactly that and they were sold for I don't know how many millions of dollars. They just automated this process. Okay. It is a little bit more than that. Okay, so let's go back to the objective function. I'm gonna argue that the sum, so we already saw that what I'm trying to do is minimize the sum of squares. Okay, so in matrix form, I can write the sum of squares as this product here, y minus x theta times y minus x theta. To convince yourself that this is true, just take a simple example where you have y1, y2 minus x11, x12, x21, x22 times, so this would be j of theta. Times theta1 times theta2 transpose <coughs> times y1, y2, that's the left hand side, and then I can rewrite this as <coughs> And now x1 vector 
trans uh, the x1 vector is just uh, let me make sure I get the right columns will be just equal to oops, nothing. x1 vector will be just equal to x11 and x12 and the vector x2 is equal to x21, x22 and so this is equal to y1, y2 minus x1 theta and then x2 times theta So I'm just multiplying. <coughs> I'm multiplying the vector x1 times theta 1 times theta 2, and that's just x1 times theta. And then I do the same for x2. Transpose, and then I do the same with the other guys y1, y2. minus x1 theta, x2 theta. And I do know that y, I do know that y1 hat is just x1 transpose theta. Let me just check one quick thing for you guys, because I think I used uh, All right, let me define it like that. And that's just equal to y1, y2 minus y1 hat, y2 hat transpose times y1, y2 minus y1 and y2 hat. And that's just equal to the vector with entries y1 minus y1 hat and then y2 minus y2 hat times the vector <coughs> that has entries y1 minus y1 hat times the vector y2 minus y2 hat and that's just equal to y1 minus y1 I've run out of space hang on y1 minus y1 hat squared plus y2 minus y2 hat squared. Okay, so I did it for 2D case, um, but the point being that if you have something that's the sum of squares, you can write it in matrix form as just y minus x theta times y minus x theta. Um, but you need to use the transpose. Another form in which this is written is because y is a vector n by 1 because y, each y is one dimensional um, and so when, when I write y minus x theta times y minus x theta I'm just essentially taking the dot product of two vectors and by the definition of the norm the dot product is just the norm of y minus x theta squared that's another way in which we will write it
Once I have everything in matrix notation, however, it's a lot easier to manipulate. And I, in fact, I will never go again through the tedious exercise of trying to go from the, the sum notation to the matrix notation. I will just simply use matrix notation because it's a lot easier to manipulate. And it's a lot easier to code because sums involve four loops in the code and they're inefficient. Okay, this equation, if I have only two thetas, as we, uh, as is in the example that I would have done the differentiation, uh, what was, what I've had the, the equivalence relation, if I have two thetas, because it's quadratic in theta, it's the equation of a parabola. With two thetas, with one theta it's a parabola, with two thetas it's uh, essentially a parabola in 2D. So J of theta is this function here. That's my j of theta. When I have only two thetas, theta one and theta two. Now the nice thing about a parabola is that I, um, if if I am anywhere in the parabola and I go downhill, I will always reach the same point. It has a unique solution. So learning. And in this case, it's very easy. But learning is about starting at some point in some objective function and going downhill. That's learning. You formulate the problem as a cost function that you need to so optimize, solve for. And then you solve for theta by going downhill. When the function is as simple as this quadratic function, by going downhill you always get a solution. And in fact, we will show you only need to take, you can go downhill in a single step and get to the optimum because we can do things analytically. Later on when we do neural networks, there's not going to be just one minimum, but there's going to be, the functions are going to have, you know, it's going to, are going to be very jaggedy. They're going to have a factorial number of minima. And the way to get there will still be by following the gradients. But in, that, in those cases, it will not be possible to do it by hand anymore, as we will do today. But we will have to follow derivatives. Now, um, let me just one more point, and then I'll take your question. When we slice a function in 2D, like I've done here with these lines, um, these, these black lines, um, these are called contour plots. And if you slice them, they basically tell you the height. Um, they basically give you curves where the height is the same. So this is what I'm showing you here in red. These are the contours. There is one fact that I'm not going to derive it in this class, but it's learned in calculus too. And that fact is that the gradient or the derivative of j of theta with respect to theta is a vector. And that vector is at any, evaluated at any point is perpendicular to the contours. OK, so how many of you have seen that fact before? Eh, not as calculus to these days. Anyway, the derivatives are always perpendicular to the contour plots. Just take that as a fact. Um, the relevance of that is that if you go in the opposite direction as these arrows, you're going in the steepest descent. So if you're snowboarding, that place where it's the steepest to go down, that's the way you're going to go. Because that's where you learn the most. The, the steeper it is, the more you learn. OK. So um, what, what I'm going to do in the next class is I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to compute the derivative of this function, and I'm going to solve for theta, because where the derivative becomes 0, that is at the bottom, that's where the solution lies. And when I solve for it, I will get the least square solution. And then I will show how I can do the same thing, but instead of using a cost function, instead of minimizing a cost function, I will maximize the likelihood of the data given theta. And I'm going to use Gaussians for that. And when I do that, I will get the same answer. 
maximum likelihood, least squares is a, a particular case of maximum likelihood estimation. And that's the next class. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.